Tonight, before I begin, <clears throat> I'd like to address a word to our young adults, single adults. I know that there are several of our younger people now that are approaching a time of adulthood and a, and a desire for proper companionship. And I want you to know that we understand some of the challenges associated with that time of life. But I'd remind you of this word, keep thyself pure. Be pure, young people. At all costs, be pure. Yeah. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Yeah. Don't allow yourself to be in any kind of circumstance where the devil has the upper hand. Right. Yeah. It, and God will help you to do this. Yeah. Just as there's a God that has particular note for older people and there are things that attend <laughs> older age he has a, a sensitivity to the, those of your age, too. And we want the very best for you. But it's imperative that, that, that we say this occasionally. Mm -hmm. Keep yourself pure. <clears throat> now tonight, <coughs> we'll be in Ephesians 6, verse 4. This will be our 73rd installment in this text. Now we're dealing with the practicality of spiritual life. <clears throat> and the spiritual life is translated into everyday living. And this has been overlooked by many people. Most people that I know, Christian people, have really not seen this. This is a little bit blurry to them. It's largely because of inst Religious life has been institutionalized by spiritual Babylon. That is, it has been, they have compartmentalized life. <clears throat> and so they think of religious life and church life and domestic life and employment life and national life, and they're all like, like separate compartments now, it is expected that different mindsets accompany each of these segregations of life so that a person conducts their life differently in each now this is wrong to do this but this is the conclusion people have reached so they don't connect this facet of their life and that facet of life with living for God. So they conduct themselves at a religious gathering differently than they do at home. And they, they conduct themselves on the job differently than they do in the assembly. Now Paul is nailing down that this is, this. I'm sorry, this is not allowed. This kind of thinking is unlawful thinking. It's, it's not proper. No person is granted the liberty of conducting their life outside the parameter of their identity with God. You, you are not even allowed to live this way. I want to emphasize this. This is not even allowed. But it is practiced every day. There are people, I suppose they're sincere, but although I must be candid with you, I don't really think they are, but they may be sincere, but they just don't live their whole life for God. They don't conduct themselves. This is not why God saved the people. This is not why Jesus died. I have known more cases than I want to have known 
of people whose lives have become disturbed and chaotic simply because they were not living for God. Now, this is something we can't, you know, make a person do, but it is our job to make people aware of this sort of thing. Some people often, when it comes to political concerns, like they adopt a completely different persona than they have otherwise. In some parts of life, the person is ruled by emotion. In other parts, they're ruled by, the, by their intellect. Some people's lives are ruled by convenience. You see, our lives are to be ruled and dominated by faith. Amen. The substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. And see, it's easy to talk about this, but it, <laughs> it takes some hearty effort to live by faith. It, that's why we need the brethren. We need constant recourse to God. We, there needs to be an open channel. Can you see it? There needs to be an open channel between earth and heaven. There's, for this to happen, there's, that's got to be. And now the good news is that Jesus has procured this, so you cannot just live for God. There's all the means required to do that have been made available to us in Christ Jesus. Now some people, <laughs> when you live these compartmentalized lives, this way under that circumstance, that way under the other circumstance, this kind of living is attended by a lot of frustration and is generally a lot of murmuring happens in it because see there's a part of life not lived unto God so when it chafes against the person it, they murmur like the Israelites because they weren't really living for God and when living these scattered kind of lives the assembly of the saints is largely unproductive because there's too big of an adjustment has to take place <coughs> The person has been living for self or been dominated by personal interests or overly emotional, or however you want to put it. Then you come into the assembly of the saints and there's, there's a, such a large adjustment that's required that they can't adapt. So maybe they sleep, maybe they talk, maybe they read. Why? is because they've been living this compartmentalized life. They haven't been living unto God. Now, I want to be careful not to, not to, this to not to degenerate into judging other people, this sort of thing. This is a, just a personal thing that everyone has to see. <laughs> see, Babylon has brought a certain dignity to this helter-skelter kind of life. And it even provides for these emotional and pleasurable outlets that aren't really under God. They're really personally centered. It has provided outlets for this kind of yes. life. And it's a, it's a tragedy, actually. Amen. So it's pushed people into disassociating whole bodies of their life with God. They just they never have really made a connection between great parts of their life, maybe the majority of time is involved, but they haven't connected it with God. Just such a thing as like sleeping. And before you go into sleep, committing your way to God because you're vulnerable during your sleep. You're, Satan has access to your mind in your sleep that is not ordinarily, he does not have. But if you just sleep to sleep, <laughs> well, I, I probably said enough about that at this time. Now, Paul is opening up this matter in this text about practicality, how you live for God. So we're in verse 4 of chapter 6. Ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, Amen. ye fathers. <coughs> Other versions read, you fathers or parents. Some versions read, 
parents. And it is true that technically the word translated fathers can mean parents, but not in the Bible. It's in Greece and literature. The word translated father is used over 400 times in Scripture, and it's always translated father. And there is a word in Scripture for parents. It's a different, it's a different word. So I'm, I'm proceeding that fathers is the proper word here. Now there's differing classes of humanity that are referenced in Scripture. There's men and there's women. There's fathers and husbands and wives and children. There's masters and servants and kings and governors and young and old and Jew and Gentile. <coughs> Different classes of people from one point of view. And in the body of Christ there's apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers and the various gifts that God has placed in the church. Yet none of them are exempt from living by faith. Not one of those categories. Wherever there's a rational mind, the person is obligated to serve God. Whether they want to or not. That doesn't the only way that enters into it is is a matter of actually being blessed. Because if a person doesn't want to serve God, God will not want to answer them. Amen. That's the way it is. <clears throat> no classification of believers can live outside the parameter of their life in Christ. They can't depart from being a Christian to do anything. Yeah, Makes no difference what it is. It sounds simplistic from one point of view, but... Many professing believers have chronic difficulty with doing everything to the glory of God. They just, it's hard for them. Why is it hard for them? Because they've got this view of compartmentalized life. They think of their lives as this kind of life, that kind of life, and are governed by different kind of principles and a different mindset and so forth. So fathers are at no time free to live by any other rule than the rule of faith. So in view of that, he's going to address the word to them, fathers. Provoke not your children under wrath. Now this is a pretty, pretty profound sentence. It's been translated other ways like, do not exasperate. Don't make your children angry. The wholesome, the, another Bible says, don't irritate your children and make them resentful. God's Word Bible says, don't make your children bitter about life. Don't, fathers, don't make it hard for your children to live. Never drive your children to resentment. Living Bible says, do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. Don't keep on scolding and nagging. <laughs> it's pretty personal, isn't it? Don't keep on scolding and nagging your children, making them resentful. Don't push your children to the point of rage. Don't irritate your children. Don't be hard on your children. Don't overcorrect your children or make it difficult for them to obey the commandment. Don't exasperate your children by coming down hard on them. Do not exasperate them to resistment, resentment. Now children, they don't have a lot of understanding. That's part of being a child. So this has to do with don't, don't treat them as though they did have all the understanding. Don't be demanding like they comprehended everything you said. Be consistent in your teaching and direction of them. Don't be unduly harsh or make unreasonable demands. 
I know most of the brethren here know this, but this this can get away from you in a moment of rage. It can involve those things as unwarranted neglect. Little children can, little infants can pick up on whether they're neglected or whether they're cared for. It's a kind of a kind of a arresting thing to consider, but they kind of they're attracted to their mothers. You see, you'll see this sometimes. They'll just calm down for the mother. There's some way in which they they have picked up on this care. There's other people they'll be afraid they'll they'll draw back from them. Perhaps it can involve such unwarranted embarrassment in public as can cause confusion and discouragement. See, some parents allow their children to run about and shout and make noise and act like they're wild at home and then they got to be calm at the assembly. This is confusing to the children. It's the thing he's talking about. This is the kind of thing he's talking about here. If your children can't behave anywhere else, why in the world would you expect them to behave here? Fathers, don't provoke your children to wrath. Don't expect them to live in this compartmentalized manner like you do. <laughs> You'll be able to adapt with your life. You live one kind of life at home, one kind of life at church, one kind of life on the job, and, and you, you're training your children that, as though that's how they're to live. It's, but it's confusing to innocent little ones. They can't figure this out. How come I have to be different there than here? Why can I shout and spit and throw tantrums here, but I can't there? Mm -hmm. Don't provoke the children yeah. to wrath. They tolerate children picking at each other and provoking one another at home, get upset with them when they do it in church. <laughs> they can push a cart around Walmart, the kids screaming like wild all the, all the time they're shopping, but they expect them to be real nice and docile when they're at home or at the church. Provoke not your children. To read. That doesn't mean make sure that make sure that you always can appeal to them. Don't ever ask them to do anything they don't want to do. That isn't what it means. Although some people do do this. Some parents require uh, allow their children to develop inappropriate manners at home then they chide and punish them for exhibiting those manners away from home <laughs> don't provoke your children to wrath you expect people to be reasonable when they're dealing with you you'll be the same with your children be reasonable I would suspect that most of us fathers are, have not acquired perfection in this area it's quite convicting, as a matter of fact, to deal with things like this, but you have to deal with them. Amen. Some countries of the world, this really has particular relevance. Some children are treated like wayward slaves, beaten and confined and tied up. Every once in a while you read about children locked up in a closet and left without food and left without needs and provoke not your children to wrath. See, there are different measures of how a person can do this. Some children at an unreasonably young age are forced to fend for themselves. When we lived in Indiana many years ago, there was a family that lived out by us that actually did this. My wife noticed a winter day, about a foot deep of snow. It's a two-year-old girl walking through the snow barefoot. So she went out and got the little girl, and she was just from two houses down. Both her parents worked, two years old. That little girl was left at home by herself all day, every day, two years old. She was a smart little girl. She figured out how to get something to eat at home. But she was confused about the whole thing. She'd been provoked to wrath by unreasonable demands. We, so my wife told the family, we'll take care of your daughter while you're gone. We took care of her. She's a fine, fine little girl. 
But who knows how she would have turned out if she wasn't directed properly. Now ponder how the Lord cares for his children. This will help, help us. Those that are young in the faith. A bruised reed he'll not break. A smoking flax he'll not quench. See, that's how. All your children won't be the same. Some children will be easy to break. Some children will be easy to encourage. You you got you you got to discern the, the difference. You can't treat them all alike. You can't. I mean, well, I we we treat every, all our children alike. Well, see, this isn't true. Yeah. You can't do this because they're not all alike. Yeah. Not provoke your children to wrath demands that you know your know your children. The Lord is is tolerant of the immature who don't yet understand, and He'll sometimes make them stand. Not command them to stand, like you better stand, but he'll cause them to stand because of their condition. They don't understand yet. He does not require more of people than they're able to do. God always does things according to that which a man has, not that which he has not. This is how God looks at the situation. He makes allowance for inadvertent errors that weren't my sister June has been a very good wife for me because I had this temptation to be too harsh and demanding. Every once in a while she'd say, now they're just being children. They're not being obstinate. They're, they're being a, a child. So then you have to kind of think the thing out to, to detect when they're just being a child and when they're being stubborn. You gotta, <laughs> don't provoke your children to wrath. It's only right that we believers treat our children like God treats His. <clears throat> Alright, don't provoke them to wrath. Don't be too demanding. Don't be too harsh. Don't push them beyond their ability so life becomes a bitter experience for them. Oh, brethren, <laughs> we don't want our homes to be a bitter experience for our children. Amen. And I don't think they are here, but there, there are some people that their children are just living at home is a hard experience for them. Well, instead of provoking them to wrath, bring them up. Other versions say give them training Raise them up. Nourish them. Williams Bible says take care of them. Bring them up tenderly, Weymouth says. Raise them up properly, Holman Bible. Take them by the hand and lead them, message. Rear them tenderly, amplified. They're like a little ball of unmolded clay, these children are. You're going to play a significant role in what they end up. But a lot of parents, they don't think about this. They think just about themselves, about how things are going for them. They don't, they forget they're shaping these children, what they're going to be in the future. Raise them up. The word bring them up or translated from a single word, it means to nourish to maturity. Not just take care of today, today, but you're targeting them growing up and then having an advantage, having all the advantages that are available to adult life. Amen. Rear them up, educate them is the meaning of the word. Bring them up or provide food for, that's another, and that'd be food for the mind as well as food for the body. All this is set within the context of children are the heritage of the Lord. And the fruit of the womb is his reward. God has loaned you your children. Amen. Yes, yes, brother. As I'm thinking about this translation of the message, it says, take them by the hand and lead them. There is a time when the Lord does lead us by the hand because we're immature in the faith mm -hmm. and not able to withstand things that other seasoned brethren might be able to. But there is a time 
but he does expect us to fend for ourselves. He won't always take us by the hand yeah. and say, now this is what you do step by step. He, in the time that he is leading you by the hand, he's giving you wisdom. He's teaching you so that you can fend for yourself, yeah. and that's what he expects. The leading you by the hand is an expectation of you maturing later. Yeah. Yeah, the idea is to make the transition from childhood to manhood. Be able to make the transition. But if you treated your children as, like babies <laughs> till they're up in their teens, they're going to have a hard time becoming an adult. Yes, Sister June. There's another place in Scripture where it talks about God taking Israel by the hand. By the hand. But now, it doesn't... Uh, not you, you kind of alluded to this in, in your opening remarks about uh, not provoking them to wrath. We live in a generation that has got this so twisted. It, it's hard for people to even... I've watched people at the store with their... I mean, not study them, but you can't get away from them, so you do watch them. Uh, how they do with, with their children. And they are overindulgent. Now, this yeah. is a matter of provoking yeah. them to wrath, right. too. Yeah. That's right. The point is not to ask them to do something in public that you don't ask them to do in private. It's to ask them to do everywhere the right thing is under the Lord. Yeah. So if it's wrong to bounce off the walls in public, then they shouldn't be bouncing off the walls at home. Because God's watching you everywhere. Yeah, amen. Because you're developing their character. And, and it's... It's what, it, this is a stewardship that we're, we are given, that we're going to give an answer for. And we have to be as serious about giving an answer for ourselves as we are about wanting them to be able to give the best answer for themselves. Amen. Whenever the Lord requires it. Ada, whenever she was little, not real super little, but, and she, this was a genuine question. She says, how come children have to obey their parents? So it wasn't a challenge. So I told her, I said, well, it's because God gives everybody a job. As a parent, my job is to take care of you and to, and to make sure that you grow up to know God and to do what's right for you. Your job is to take that instruction. Mm -hmm. And one day, we're both going to stand before the Lord, and I'm going to tell God why I did the job I did and you're going to tell him why you did the job you did. That's right. Mm -hmm. Amen. See, bringing up children involves bringing them to maturity so when they're ready to receive and live for the Lord of glory, they will do it. Yes, that's what you're targeting. This is not the responsibility of the church. It's the responsibility of the fathers. This is not the responsibility of a youth ministry. It's the responsibility of the fathers and of the parents. It's a solemn charge delivered to them. You don't pawn this off on somebody else. It's no one else's business to raise your children. Now, I understand that there are circumstances of life where sometimes we need help. I mean, that's to be, but those are unusual. They do exist, and we should rally to the help of those that need help. Let's look at this a little further. Under the law, God told the people they were, they were responsible for their children. God told the people to listen to what he said. Here's what he said through Moses. That they may learn to fear me all the days that they shall live upon the earth and that they may teach their children. So when you're in the presence of the Lord, parents, you don't want to be dozy. You want to be alert because God's speaking to you, so you will speak to your children. Amen. That was how the law was. That's how it operated. Before he died, Moses told the people, gather the people together, men, women, and children, and thy strange that is within thy gates, that they may hear and that they may learn and fear the Lord your God and observe to do all the words of this law, and that their children, which have not known anything, may hear 
and learn to fear the Lord your God as long as ye live in the land whither ye go over Jordan to possess it. That your children, which don't know anything, may learn to hear and fear. All right, now see, our children that sit in the assembly, they should be learning to fear God. What we say should lead to that kind of a conclusion for the children. Jehoshaphat addressed the people when he instituted a spiritual renewal or revival. They stood before the Lord with their little ones, their wives, and their children. They didn't farm them off. This was they were hearing the word of God. They didn't say, we got to get the children of us. We concentrate on what's being said. Let's, so let's, let's, let's sequester the children off here so we can pay better attention. <laughs> now you raise your children so they can pay attention with you. When Jehoshaphat addressed the people, all Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones and their children. When Ezra prepared to lead the people back to Canaan, he proclaimed a fast there at the river of Ahava that we might afflict ourselves before our God and seek for him a right way for us and for our little ones. <laughs> what I'm saying here is that God's always operated this way. To keep the little ones, that's the ones without understanding, to keep them in mind so that they're raised up in an environment where, where their conscience is, is formed. It's not foreign, brethren, in a nursery yeah, that's right. that's right. or in a preschool. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, that's not where it's formed. Mm -hmm. Then we got the case of young Samuel. <coughs> We're talking about bring them up. Young Samuel, in response of thanksgiving to the Lord for enabling her to have a child when she was barren, yeah. Hannah lent her child to the Lord for as long as he lived. He was actually brought up, bring them up. He was actually brought up in the tabernacle by Eli, the high priest. And he ministered before the Lord, being a child. <laughs> and girded with a linen ephod, which was a garment associated with serving God. So it's a little child. That's, we'll talk about bring up, bring them up. Someone say, well, it, he can't understand. Yeah, but while he was growing up, he did learn to understand. Yeah, that's right, yes. No, we know there's some things they don't understand, but you've got to be able to produce an environment, fathers, to where they at least can come to understand. Yes. That scripture, and it says, um, and that their children which have not known anything may hear and learn fear the Lord. Dear God, I was thinking, because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, yeah, that's it right. will teach these children to learn how to discern the scripture yeah. and the Lord while they're young. That's yeah. right. Amen. 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 Yeah. yeah, brother, we know that children will learn yeah. something yeah. from someone. That's you know? right. Yeah. We want to make, as our parents, we want to make sure that they're learning it truth from us. Amen. Because they will learn. Yeah. Amen. They're being shaped. Mm -hmm. Then there was Joseph and Mary. They were charged with raising or bringing up the Christ child. How's that for a responsibility? Joseph and Mary trained him so well that at 12 he preferred to be in the temple with the doctors of the law. That tells you how well they did their job. They raised him up properly. And under their capable leadership, Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. He took heed. And there was the ministry of Jesus. I'm showing here that God says considerable about little ones and children in the formation of their preferences and character. During the ministry of Jesus, the people picked up on this. And they brought their children to Jesus so that he'd put his hands on them and bless them. Why did they do that? They got some kind of inclination. When they heard Jesus speak, they didn't say, well, this is obviously just for the adults. <laughs> yeah. 
They brought their children to them. When they did, his disciples rebuked them. It's like, this is a special meeting for the adults. And Jesus rebuked them. He says, suffer little children and forbid them not to come to me. Little children. You know, I don't know if you will ever encounter a little child that isn't interested in learning about Jesus. I know I've never encountered a case where a little child was obstinate about, about Jesus. Or what about the parents that didn't take advantage of that holy innocence? Yes. As you're talking here, it, it has uh, occurred to me that there, there are some things that people learn better in some circumstances than other. And I know you're going to, to bring this uh, this around to us learning of the Lord Himself. God has has placed us uh, when we were small in a family, mm -hmm. and not just a teaching situation. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is this is a a situation. People have said before, you know, your children know. Mm -hmm. They know whether you're real or whether you're not. Mm -hmm. well, see, this is a context in which the children are able to witness from someone they trust yeah. and someone that they're constantly with, uh -huh. yeah. that it's like bearing witness to the truth day by day by day and uh, without any interruption. It's like it's a consistent witness that they can observe and then as they see your faith worked out in your conduct and in your conduct toward them. Mm -hmm. See, they're developing, this is in the best sense of the word, mm -hmm. they are developing a concept of their relationship. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, that's what, what sets the, one of the things that, that sets the, uh, the teaching and the example of a parent above all others. First, you have them whenever they're the most impressionable. Mm -hmm. And you have them all the time so that they know whether you're speaking lies or the truth. Mm -hmm. Do you believe what you say? Do you live what you say? They'll know that. Mm -hmm. And it reinforces this to them. And then uh, the fact that it's ideally, it, it was intended to be not a, a, a relation of indulgence, but a relation of love. Mm -hmm. That they, they know that mm -hmm. this is someone who really cares about them. Mm -hmm. To make them do what's right, and to, I mean, it can be pleasant, there are times when it's not pleasant, but mm -hmm. it's always what is right. It's always mm -hmm. consistent. It's always with God in mind, and they can see that. Amen. Mm -hmm. yeah, Brother Given, yes. this can also be a very edifying experience when um, you have, you, you talked about the little children wanting to know about Jesus. Well, when, when they start to learn, it's a very fulfilling experience when they come back and they tell you something that oh, they yeah. learned. <laughs> and they show you, you know, uh, something that they've thought it out. They've thought this thing out. And at a little age, they can they can tell you something that they come up with. This is very edifying. Mm -hmm. Amen. And it's also very edifying. Um, I found when I was um, instructing the younger, um, the older elementary kids in Dallas, um, that you can see the parents' um, ferventness for the children to understand the Lord. Because I would just introduce something, and then they would just like give a dissertation as a little kid um, that you didn't really expect, that the things that would come out of their mouth, well, there is the parents being raised up, um, yeah. raising up their child and the nurturing that admonition. Of the Brought up, see, and bringing up the environment mm -hmm. is everything. Yes. We have, of course, the raising of Timothy also. Oh, Timothy's father was a Greek and was, it appears, not a believer. This young man was faithfully brought to maturity, mm -hmm. brought up by his mother and grandmother. Paul said, I call to remember the unfeigned, unpretentious faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice. You see, Lois raised up Eunice. Yeah. Eunice raised up Timothy. Yeah. Right. And from a child, he knew the scriptures. Mm -hmm. He was brought up. Yeah. See, brethren, there are a lot of 
church children that have never been brought up. Yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> they, a lot of things they learned, they were in mid-adulthood before they learned things they couldn't have learned when they were children. Tragic circumstance. In our time with a church that caters to young people, provides youth ministers and babysitting programs, we have a generation of young people that's sorely lacking in their knowledge of God. Why is this so? They were not brought up. Full-grown men like Peter and Andrew and James and John, Philip and Nathaniel, have been raised up in such a manner that when the Christ appeared, they spotted him. They were raised up. So you're raising your children so when the Christ is presented to them in such a manner as they must make a decision now about him, they're ready to do it. The devout men that assembled and heard Peter on the day of Pentecost, they'd been brought up. So he could say, this is that, and they knew what he was talking about. They could refer to Joel and David, and they knew what he was talking about. Yes, sister. And when children are really small, it's easier for them to believe. That's right. Yeah. Um, so, so you can reason with them and teach them a lot when they're very young. Amen. That's why it's important to teach them truth. Because, I mean, Satan has made uh, all kind of little fairy tales and things, you know, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with watching cartoons or whatever, but there's a lot of things that aren't true that kids get to see, and they uh -huh. might believe that. So it's important to make sure they know truth and that Amen. you're speaking yeah. to them about truth and you're explaining truth, true things to them so they can reason on truth and then <laughs> they'll have a love for the truth and be able to distinguish these things. Amen. Amen. You know that there is, you, maybe you're one of these people, but there are people who if you said this is that, they wouldn't have the faintest idea what you were talking about. Said this is what Joel said. Uh -huh. they, would have, they wouldn't have the faintest idea what you were talking about. Why not? They weren't brought up. Bring them up. To state the matter succinctly, we're living in an ignorant and disobedient religious generation that reflects how they were brought up. That condition has been produced during the day of salvation. Keep that in mind. During the day when the heavens have been opened and a new and living way has been sanctified and all things pertaining to life and God have been supplied. In that time, this situation has taken place. Which means somebody didn't bring them up. See, your job isn't just to manage your children. Your job is to bring them up. Amen. Bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Amen. Now Paul instructs how to bring them up. Nurture. Other versions say training. Some say discipline, chastening, the Lord's kind of discipline, instruction, Christian discipline, correction, loving discipline, training and discipline. The word nurture is translated from a word that means the whole training and education of children, which relates to the cultivation of mind and morals and employs for this purpose now commands admonitions, now reproof and punishment, that is, while they're children. It also includes the training and care of the body and whatever in adults also cultivates the soul is developed when the children are young, they're trained. Actually, the predominant thought in nurture is chastening or discipline, that is, <coughs> the children are not allowed to be unruly. This is not, we're not talking about words here. We're not talking about sitting in the corner or stand, sitting on the couch or standing in the corner. We're not talking about that now. We're talking about you, you do not allow 
bad manners to develop. You stop it and abort it, whatever it takes. That's what discipline involves. It's an action, something you do, not something you say. You've got to get to the sane part of it. And it's a large word that primarily has to do with the environment in which a child is raised or brought to maturity. They grow up in an environment where ungodliness is not tolerated. It, I mean, it just isn't. And sometimes you have to start young. You, you can see that there are some children that are bent in the wrong direction rather early on. You've got to get that twig straightened up. And you do it by discipline, just like, just like the Lord does. That's what He does. He'll break your leg if necessary. He makes straight paths for your feet, lest that which is be turned out of the way. One version says, lest he break your leg. <laughs> that this is much easier to do with a little one mm -hmm. oh, than it yeah. is with a full-grown. We, uh -huh. We've got a whole culture now of yeah. adults yeah, who can't easy. be controlled. It's not easy yeah. then, that's three right. Three million people in prison. Mm -hmm. This is the mercy of the Lord. See, growing up actually is it just a fact of growing up versus being created an adult shows the mercy of God. That he allows people, to, children to grow up and be shaped yeah. while they're shapeable you might say. But if the parents are not alert to this, well, someone else will raise your children for you. They'll teach them for you. This word, nurture, is only used, the, the word from which it is translated is only used four times in the Bible. The first is this one here, nurture. The second is 2 Timothy 3.16 where it's translated instruction, training, correcting, and correction of error and discipline and obedience. Now this is not just verbal correction. It's not what we're talking about here. He that spareth the rod hated his own son. Said foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod will drive it far from him. Yeah, some people don't believe that. Yeah, right. So the children are brought up stubborn and rebellious. Could be thrashed out of them when they were young. I understand it's not, this doesn't mean a unwarranted abuse. I, I, I understand, you shouldn't have, we shouldn't have to be told it doesn't mean that. But it does mean that there comes an age where the only kind of thing a children understand, a child understands is pain. There's not, nothing pleasant about this. Sometimes you'd rather not do it. And I'll just have a talk with little Joe. Now there's some things, talking is it's all done past the stage of talking. Yeah. Yeah, but they'll understand this, yeah. just like you understand it when the Lord knocks you down. There's, <laughs> there's sometimes the Lord just has to knock you down so you look up, <laughs> get you on your back so your eyes are pointed up. Sometimes that is. That happens. Well, we want to raise our children, so this is brought to a minimum. This, mm -hmm. yeah. this doesn't have to be done. It doesn't take very much pain to discipline a little child no. that way. Mm -hmm. Not compared to dealing with an adult. Oh, it's another control. matter. Yeah. It's another matter. It's a large word. This word, nurture, it has to do primarily with an environment in which a child is raised or brought to maturity. It's one for rebellion and appetite for unlawful things just to, aren't, aren't allowed, that's all. And I know that many of you, I know firsthand, have actually practiced this. I, I remember you doing it. We practice it, and sometimes we had to have a periodic purging, you know, of the house. That we did it. Missed a bunch of squalling and bawling, and we did it anyway. Sorry that some things just aren't allowed, that's all there is to it. And, of course, it involves the, the encouragement of wholesome mm -hmm. yes. traits also. <laughs> you remember in Hebrews 12:10 it says, we, we have had fathers of our 
flesh which corrected us, we gave them obedience. Shall we not much rather be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure. That is, they were guided by their own feelings on the matter. Whether right or wrong wasn't the point, but he, God, for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. That's the same kind of incentive we must have in correcting the children. The aim of chasing a correction is not simply to stop the expression of what's wrong, but to clear the way for the culture of what's right. Yeah, yeah. Yes, Sister Barb. In the discipline and chastening, there's associations that we're trying to help them make. Mm -hmm. That's right. That when, when they choose <clears throat> sin, then the consequence is pain. Mm -hmm. And we're doing that to culture a hatred for sin. That's right. A hatred for the things that are, that are wrong because Amen. they associate it with pain. Mm -hmm. And you can, in bringing up, the word bringing up means this is a consistent manner. You can see that if on Monday and Tuesday we keep, we're not allowed to go astray, but on Thursday and Friday we are, this inconsistency introduces confusion and exasperation. They don't know what, they can't figure it out. So the, the raising and training and discipline of our children must be consistent. Because this is the manner of the kingdom. See, Paul is introducing us to the manner in which God deals with his children. And we can't deal with our children differently than God deals with his children. Why? Because then, then how God deals with us becomes obscure. Yeah, that's right. This impacts directly on how we conduct our lives toward the Lord. <coughs> In the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Now we get to the verbalization of the... The teaching and fear of the Lord, or the information of the Lord, or the doctrine of the Lord, some versions read. The idea is, the admonition is to be in words that God has spoken, words of Scripture. The cause is to be traced back to what God said. That's got to be the root of the matter. That's got to be the root of the matter. The nurture and admonition of the Lord. This is the verbal bringing up to maturity. Chasing and correction are to be linked to Scripture, not just to that makes mommy and daddy mad. Yeah. That can't be the primary consideration. We are never freed from the responsibility to the God who saved us, just as children are never freed from their responsibility to their parents, which is a reflection, see, of this higher matter. Now this includes the rational and emotional and inward expression of the person. The whole person must be connected with what God said. Well, how he thinks, the rational, how he feels, the emotional, and what he does, the expression. It has to be linked with what God has said on those matters. Otherwise, the soul can't be stabilized. The word, the soul of a child cannot be stabilized just by the words of the parent. Yeah. The words of the parent had to be synchronized yeah. with the word of God, which yeah. brings God into the right. scenario. And God will carry up, will make sure the instruction is effective. Many of the people of God lived a good many years before they became aware of these things. Some people were well into adulthood before this dawned on them. Why? They weren't brought up properly. Now their parents may have been kind, parents may have taught them to be polite, how to be considerate. None of that's bad. But if the child grew up and didn't know how to recognize God and didn't know how to respond to God and didn't flee to Christ for refuge at an early age, I don't care who the parent was, or who the parents were, they didn't bring up their children correctly or they had canes and Ishmael's in the house. One or the other. Now, now our job isn't to look back and say, well, my parents were wrong and all. That's not what 
what we're trying to say is, as far as you, as far as you are concerned as a parent, you must raise your children so the first opportunity they have to receive Christ, they receive him. And they believe him. And they obey him. The first time Jesus walks by and they recognize it, they leave John the Baptist and follow Christ. See, that's bringing them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So the, the admonition reflects the mind of the Lord. Now this, this final thought is my, my opinion. But the modern church has been greatly weakened by disobedience in the matter addressed in this text. A large part of the church has been disobedient in this matter of raising them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And that is what has produced a generation as wayward. Now, I understand that there is such a thing as raising them up faithfully and they go astray. I, I understand that, that some of us have had this happen. And you must not allow that to condemn you. If you've, if you've raised up a cane or an Ishmael and you begin to wonder, well, maybe I didn't do what's right, but you got four, five, six other children that turned out all right, you should be able to think the thing out. Say, no, I have it. This isn't because I was recalcitrant. Mm -hmm. I would to God all of my children yeah. were serf fervent servants of God. We raised our children so that would take place. But it, it didn't in some cases, but it better not be because we, no. because we were dilatory. Mm -hmm. It can't be because of that. Why? Remember, we're talking about how the kingdom of God operates. This is how God operates. In his, with his children, he puts them in an environment where what he wants to happen, happens. Yeah. That's how we raise our children. Yeah. In an environment where it's glaringly obvious Christ is all in all. We're living to please God, whether anybody else is happy with us or not. And uh, it'll be difficult enough under those circumstances. So you see the practicality of this? Amen. Some people would prefer that <laughs> we didn't talk about things like this because they can be rather uh, <laughs> convicting. But we've got to talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. Because whatever on earth does not agree with what's in heaven makes it more difficult to comprehend the things that are of heaven. See, you can see that, can't you? That if you're living in an environment where God isn't the central consideration, it like emits like a cloud between heaven and earth. It makes it all the more difficult to see. And so whatever control you have in this matter, exercise it with all confidence and godly consideration. Amen. Any of you have something you'd like to add on this text? Yes, Sister Bailey. One thing I was considering with some of the children that I've um, seen or um, heard of, um, I was just, my mom was recently told me that um, Malachi Woods preached yesterday for 45 minutes. How many kids do you hear of that are of age five and six that will preach for almost 45 minutes yeah. starting in Daniel and ending in the ascension of Christ. That's right. I mean, there's not very many. And then some of the kids um, at the renewal were going around a tower of blocks and they and it fell down and they said Babylon has fallen. <laughs> there's not very many kids that do that, but that just proves that they are being brought up right. In That's life. right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Um, I consider when you were talking about how the child must be disciplined at a young age. Um, I was considering with a potter, when he is using clay, he must use it while it's mold and while it's soft. Mm -hmm. and That's if he right. If he waits for it to harden, it won't be useful yeah. as he labors. Amen. Then you have to break it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, Brother Judah. The children in the assembly here, including myself, Sister Annie, Sister Bailey, Sister Logan, Rachel, all the younger kids here, we have a great advantage. It's not because, not only because of our parents raising us in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, because, because of the attention that we get in the assembly. We have the opportunity to participate, 
I do introductions, Sister Logan does introductions, Sisters Annie and Bailey do introductions. We have a chance to participate, and Sister Debbie does singing with all of the kids. So we have a great advantage. Yes. And because of this, we will grow up to be servants of the Lord. And because of our good beginning, we will serve the Lord. And because of our good beginning, we'll serve the Lord, and it will pay big dividends. Yes. Amen. Yes, it's a burp. This admonition point I've enjoyed considering because even in adults, you consider an honest heart. Mm -hmm. And when you bring scripture to bear on something that is being, <coughs> it can be a conflict. But when you bring scripture yeah. to bear, an honest heart mm -hmm. is settled at the word of the Lord. Yes. And that's the same way it is with our children. Whenever we, whenever we bring the word of God to bear, when we are chastening and raising them up, then it, it settles their heart, and they're able to trust in these things, knowing that it's for their profit and benefit. Amen. Mm -hmm. yeah, adults may question the inspiration of scriptures, but children don't. <laughs> yes, Brother Jeremy. When you were talking about uh, the way you act at home, and in that you can't expect a child to act differently in the assembly, I was thinking about how we're also, as a, adults, preparing ourselves to yeah. fit into glory. Yeah. I mean, That's people right. that just don't pay any attention to the Lord and don't give themselves, mm -hmm. and I don't know if they think that they're just going to automatically fit in there, but we're preparing ourselves now to how we are now to just make an easy transition. Amen. Or not. Yeah, I too appreciated this word on the admonition um, portion of the scripture because it, when you when you bring the scripture to life, bit to bear on the situation, it's teaching our children to fear the Lord. That's right. They, Amen. They teach them, Amen. It teaches them to fear the Lord, and and one of the things that that I've I've seen is that like, I'll ask them a question, and it'll be this: Do you think Jesus would be pleased with what? you've said or what you've done and they've always given me an honest answer yeah, every single time they know children are very smart whenever you teach them and the things of the Lord and even in, in a situation to them that may be um, I don't know overbearing or that they may not understand as soon as you bring this admonition of the Lord to bear on the situation then they're able to mm -hmm. recognize yes amen yes it's a Jew. Yeah, the, the scripture that we were going over today, even though we talked quite a bit about children, it was the fathers uh -huh. that this was written to. Yeah. What the fathers were to do. The Sister Tasha was saying there, never she asked the children, would Jesus, would he be pleased with what you're doing? I think that's a very good question for adults as we're, mm -hmm. as we're responsible for guiding others. Would Jesus mm -hmm. be pleased at how yeah, I'm doing good. it? Would he be pleased with my neglect or my glossing over things or allowing things that were not good? Would he be pleased with me neglecting the instruction that applies to this to help them to grow up and be wise unto salvation? Would he be pleased with me insisting on right right behavior and right words and right responses, would he be pleased with me? Amen. Amen. Yes, Sister if we Moses. live in the kingdom, this is real life. That's right. I mean, uh, this is the norm. And there's so much. We live in a generation where where they think that the way we are is weird. I know. So, so we have to train our children that this is yeah. the way, this is true life. So Amen. they have to be able to identify life. Amen. 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 Yeah. Yes, Sister Maddie. Um, in my own experience with disciplining the children, I've had more success whenever I was able to get across the point that we we do or don't do certain things because it either pleases God or yeah. displeases God. Amen. And when when I've seen that they've been able to grasp that concept, it it actually gives me something to work with, so that if they continue to do this. This thing, then I can I can press the point that this is not pleasing to God. Mm -hmm. We we love God. We want to please Him, 
And so this this is like a foundation that mm -hmm. you can lay that will, will give you something stable to launch off from. That this, we want to please God. This is our desire. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, it's... Um, you mentioned this already, how necessary it is for this kind of teaching to be accomplished or done in the assembly. And it's because, you know, when, when you're a young parent, especially, you, you, can, you can have a tendency to, to overlook these kinds of things because, well, you're busy, you've got your job, you got this, you got, and, and, and life at home is kind of hectic sometimes. You've got four or five kids. But see, this, this kind of teaching, this kind of instruction by those who have gone through it already, yeah. by those who know the value of, of instructing and ad, ad, you know, and admonition and all, all the, to, 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 to give this kind of instruction <coughs> is not the easiest thing in the world to have to bring it up and, and remind the young people again to stay pure, to stay, you know, stay on course, but it's very needful. It's got to be done because yeah. this kind of this kind of teaching, it, 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 you know, anytime the assembly becomes a burden, it's time to stop and examine yourself. And you know, somebody said, "Well, it'd never be a burden to me." They haven't lived for, for Christ very long. You know, the, there comes a time when you when the world tries to come crashing, and you just gotta, by faith, say, "Wait a minute, this is <laughs> that I can't manage this stuff in the flesh, and we can't manage our families in the flesh either." This kind of stuff has got to be spoken in the assembly, taught, and held up, for so that people can understand what yeah. what yeah, are we yeah. talking about. You know, the world thinks you if they heard what we just said, they would say, "Well, I don't care what you say. We're never supposed to strike our children." That's what they teach. You're never yeah. because you could crush their personality. You could limit their expression. There's all these different arguments that the psych. Yeah psychologists have brought into the equation that we should never ever force our children to do anything they don't want to do. But the problem is, is where does this fit in then? It doesn't fit. It doesn't fit. Mr. <laughs> uh, Eva? Uh, along the same lines of what Brother Bob was just now saying, what better to limit in your child than their ability to express that which is wicked yeah. and sinful, like above all things, that alone should be stopped but in in disciplining children I, mean, I can speak from experience because I was a child but uh, when when a child is punished that punishment is unpleasant both to the parent and to the child itself but mm -hmm. um, what sister Barb was saying that that it's teaching them that there's there's a consequence yeah. for doing these things and that um, you're teaching the child to not want to desire to do those things now because the consequence that they will get later on will be so much more worse. Yes. But And I, I would just like to testify on behalf of all those that were spanked when they were a child that my spirit was not crushed and I was not traumatized. <laughs> <laughs> but it, yeah. my parents being faithful in, in uh, seeing certain things that we would do as a child and stopping those things right then was a great asset to me when I grew older. I remember even as a child that I, I would think when I was younger, is this something that I would be punished for, for doing? And that would help me not to do those things. You're teaching your child to flee from things that are ungodly and to cleave to that which is good. Amen. Yes. We'll have a word of prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we're thankful for these words of Scripture. We sense the necessity of embracing these words, and we thank Thee for speaking them, and giving us hope that we can, in fact, raise our children like You are raising us. We thank You in Jesus' name. Amen.